Uh, yeah, so thanks for, uh, for hosting the showcase. Small crowd, you're going to you know, learn a lot. Um, my name is Mark Holland, I'm a PhD candidate in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences. So I'm basically a geologist. And um, I'm going to be presenting on some of the work that's part of my dissertation. And um, uh, GPSA has sort of helped fund some of the research, some of the analytical costs, as well as travel to present this sort of stuff at uh, conferences. So to start, I, you know, I kind of like to mention that we all kind of know what a dissertation is like. You know, it's, it's this tiny little nub of new knowledge on top of a whole you know, body of, of other scientific or you know, um, liberal arts knowledge. And uh, to understand you know, what we're talking about in the dissertation is usually a lot of background. Yeah. I'm talking about geology has got tons of background. The tough part about it is it's got all this jargon and not only kind of like basic chemistry and physics, but all of the you know, Earth-specific ways of understanding it. So for the first part of this talk, I'm going to just try and catch you guys up a little bit on this sliver of you know, background knowledge, which is a bit of geology. And so there's two main things you need to understand for you know, to kind of broadly understand my research. And the first one is just plate tectonics, which is our all-encompassing theory of how the Earth works. So, you know, you could spend an entire lifetime trying to understand it. I'm going to give you a crash course. And then part two would be uh, geochronology, which is mainly what I do. And geochronology is essentially, oh, excuse me. It's, uh, it's how we determine the age of rocks, when things happened in Earth history, and also how long how we determine uh, rates and processes, how long things take. Uh, and so both of these are pretty fundamental to all aspects of geology, so I'm just going to give you this little crash course here. Here we've got Earth, right? And as we all know, sort of intuitively, Earth has these topographically high and topographically low areas that we know as continents and oceans. And the reason that these two kinds of crust are so different is that they're, they're chemically, um, geochemically different. Um, and they're also, um, their behavior through time is also very different. Uh, for example, um, oh, well, so what's important about continental crust is that it basically sticks around for a long time. And uh, literally everything about um, life, or you know, kind of life as we know it, our human life is, is based on continental crust, right? And so we have the evolution of, of all life is recorded in continental crust. All of our natural resources are largely located on continental crust. Even these offshore oil rigs typically are you know, in places that are underneath the ocean but are still on continental crust. So understanding it uh, and its genesis and its evolution through time is, is just fundamental to pretty much everything about our science. And it's very different from ocean crust, which is what's shown here on this slide. Um, and basically, the, uh, the age of ocean crust in the Atlantic is, is shown here, and the red colors are younger, and blue colors are older. So what we can see is that the Atlantic Ocean has sort of opened up along what's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge Spreading Center, and the continents have moved apart over time, right? So oldest ocean crust in North America, excuse me, in uh, the Atlantic Ocean is about 180 million years old. And uh, it turns out that that's about as old as oceanic crust gets anywhere on Earth. After that, it, um, it gets recycled back into the mantle in places on the other side of the Earth now called subduction zones. And these are these deep trenches where pieces of ocean crust, entire plates, sink back into the mantle um, and are recycled through time. So basically, all the ocean crust over in the Western Pacific is also about 200 million years old. And, um, there's nowhere on Earth where there's any ocean crust older than that. But on uh, continental crust, we've got rocks that are as old as four billion years old, right? So that's our, our long-term archive of Earth history is on continental crust. And it turns out that continental crust is probably actually made where ocean crust is recycled, at these subduction zones where ocean plates are recycled back into the mantle, because what we have is um, uh, dehydration of the downgoing plate, and melting of the mantle to produce these volcanoes. And that's what happens in subdu subduction zones, and it's generally agreed upon that that's um, that's sort of where new continental crust is made. Um, okay, yeah. But so these kind of are the main points that that's generally agreed upon that yes, that's where it happens. But uh, exactly how, what what processes are exactly responsible for it, uh, and at what rate. Uh, those are things that are debated, right? So my research is sort of uh, 
trying to aim at answering some of those questions, at least as, as, applied, as it applies to uh, North America. Um, but so that's kind of plate tectonics 101, and uh, that's the second thing we need to understand is geochronology. And basically, in any geochronology, um, we're, we're taking advantage of radioactive decay, right? So there are a number of elements out there that are unstable, and they decay at constant rates. Um, and so we, we can measure the amount of what are called parent elements or isotopes and daughter isotopes, uh, and we know the rate at which those parents should decay, and we can calculate how long you know, a, a, a thing has been decaying. So the idea here is, all right, so we've got some, some vessel, maybe it's a mineral or something, with a whole bunch of parent isotopes. And over time, some of them are going to turn to daughters, and so on. And so if we know how much daughter product, how much parent there is, we can figure out how long uh, that system has remained closed. And that's basically Geochronology 101. So my research specifically is sort of combining um, you know, the processes of plate tectonics and our knowledge of geochronology to try and understand the ancient crust of North America. So here's the Precambrian geology of North America. And um, basically, you can see here that we've got the ages of these different areas of crust in North America that are color coded. This abbreviation GA stands for giga annum, it's a billion years. So basically, all of this gray stuff up in northern Canada is over two and a half billion years old. And then um, this uh, red crust out here on sort of the east coast and a little smidge of it out in Texas, that's a, about a billion years old, right? So this is very old rock that we're trying to understand here. And um, so we're sitting here in this kind of bluish belt that was uh, added to North America sometime between 1.8 and 1.6 billion years ago. And we want to understand the exact processes that accommodated all of this new crust being added to that big chunk of old crust that is the Canadian Shield. So my research focuses on this mineral called zircon. And it turns out it's a very, very useful mineral to answer questions like when did things happen and how did they happen, right? We're going to understand um, how much new material is removed from the mantle and added to the crust by investigating this mineral. And uh, we're going to do that because it's a very common mineral. It's in practically all kinds of rocks. And it's a very resilient mineral. So it's very difficult to reset the, um, the isotopic systematics of this mineral. So that means that its, it's geochronologic clock is very reliable. Um, and it incorporates elements that are geochemically interesting and informative. One of them being uranium. And that makes it datable. So we love zircon. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we're going to be able to date it using um, the uranium lead system. So uranium uh, eventually decays to lead over a fairly long and complicated um, decay chain, but the intermediate products are, are, are very short lived. And basically, uranium decays to lead, so we measure how much lead is in zircon, we can know how old that zircon. And uh, so it's kind of like reading, reading a clock, and the clock starts essentially when the zircon crystallizes. Only we need a really fancy clock called a laser ablation inductively coupled plasma multi-collector mass spectrometer. Um, you know, you got a million bucks in your pocket, you can you can read the zircon clock. Um, so this is a sort of a picture of the uh, instrument I've used for my research. Um, and, uh, but not, not just uranium is important in, uh, in zircon. I mentioned that there are elements of geochemical interest that are incorporated, incorporated into zircon. So if we look at the um, periodic table here, Zir zircon is a zirconium silicate, and here's zirconium, and just underneath it on the periodic table is this element hafnium. And we remember our intro chemistry, things that are on, in columns typically behave in similar ways. So that means that hafnium is readily incorporated into zircon. And we're going to be able to use hafnium to learn something totally different about, um, about zircon, not just how old it is, but from what chemical reservoir within the earth it was formed. And uh, just a little bit more background we got to know here. Um, basically, the earth is sort of differentiated into these different chemical reservoirs. We've got the primitive mantle, which is very deep in the, in the earth. 
uh, the depleted mantle, which makes up the upper part of the mantle, and we call it the depleted mantle, essentially because it is the part of the mantle that melted about four billion years ago and created the crustal reservoir. So then, of course, the crust is sort of the complementary reservoir to the depleted mantle. The depleted mantle is depleted in the stuff that makes up the crust. And hafnium is partitioned in these different chemical reservoirs. Um, more specifically, its parent isotope, the TCM-176, is partitioned into different reservoirs. So we have a lot of lutetium that's partitioned into the depleted mantle and not much that's partitioned into the crust. So through time, of course, we're going to accumulate more hafnium in the depleted mantle and less in the crust. Right? So if we put this on sort of an XY plot where we've got time on the bottom here, and uh, so geologists always sort of do things going back in time, right? So it's a little tricky to get used to at first, but this would be present. And way over there is, is the past. We sort of have the beginning of the solar system and this dot over here. You know, hafnium is going to accumulate due to radiogenic decay through time. Um, but then, you know, at some point very early on in Earth's history, we differentiate the planet and make a depleted mantle reservoir and a crustal reservoir. And in hafnium time space, they're going to evolve on different paths like this. Remember, the depleted mantle is actually enriched in lutetium, and the crust is um, therefore depleted in lutetium. So it's going to accumulate less hafnium through time in these diverging paths um, that are informative for understanding, all right, where did the material that zircon crystallized come from? Did it come from a crustal reservoir or a depleted mantle reservoir? Right? Because with the zircon, we can date it thanks to uranium, and we can place it on the y-axis here with our hafnium isotopic measurements. Um, so the idea here is that because we have the um, parent of one system, uranium, and the daughter of another system, both being incorporated into the same mineral, it's kind of like having one clock that works and another clock that gets broken at the time of crystallization, right? It freezes the isotopic value that it had at that time because it has barely any parent isotope, and actually the half-life of lutetium is about 38 billion years. So there is some, it accumulates, but it's a really so you essentially have one clock that gets smashed and another clock that keeps on ticking. Um, right, so that's going to allow us to place a given zircon somewhere on a plot like this. So what my research has done has gone all around the southwestern U.S. and where, wherever these old rocks are exposed, we've got some samples from right here in New Mexico, uh, in the Sandia and the Manzano Mountains right nearby. Uh, and basically what I've done is I've taken igneous rocks um, that are sort of made from uh, molten uh, melts that are typically removed either from the mantle or the crust. Uh, and then another thing is called detrital zircon, which are zircons that are eroded out of rocks and deposited into sedimentary rocks, right? So they sort of tell us these different things, but the igneous zircon sort of telling us about um, the, the deep structure of the earth at the time that a given rock is created. And then the trial zircon are telling us about what's at the surface um, when that rock is deposited. So by combining these two, uh, we get a very detailed picture of how crust is forming and from what reservoirs um, uh, magma is being uh, generated from. All right, so this next slide is just going to kind of go. And essentially what I've done is taken a map of, of southwestern North America and keyed it to all my data with this fun color coding, right? And so rather than sort of bore you all with the uh, complexities of the, of the geology, I'm just gonna let this animation play and see all the data that I've collected. And uh, you know, thanks, to, um, thanks to GPSA in part, um, show that basically the continent is growing to the south through time. And that if you pay attention to this graph, most of our zircon is plotting along this slanted line up at the top which is the depleted mantle reservoir. So it's telling us that as North America is being assembled, we're having, we're having this uh, trend towards much more what we would call juvenile material. That's material that's removed from the depleted mantle. So it represents a new addition of crust to the, to the planet, right? It's very cool. And um, so that's, that's sort of all the, the data I've collected. And um, 
the main takeaway is that if we look at um, much younger rocks, the younger a rock is, usually the better it's understood. A rock record is more incomplete as you go back through time. So here we've got some younger rocks, and essentially this is a reconstruction of, of Pangaea, the supercontinent that would have existed about 300 million years ago. So here's North America, South America, Africa. We can open up the Atlantic Ocean, and what's going to happen is all these continents are going to swing around like this. And these are the two main, uh, what are called orogenic systems, essentially mountain belts. Um, the two main mountain belts on Earth uh, right now. And if we look at um, compilations of their geochemical trends through time in, uh, in age and half neomystopic space, we see two very different things. So the circumpacific system, it's called, um, basically the North American Cordillera and all down through the Andes, um, has this kind of a trend shown in blue, and then the Eurasian system has this kind of shotgun blast in orange. And these have been attributed to two different processes with these two different trends. The first one, up in the Circuit Pacific, is um, essentially what I would call a, a retreating subduction zone. So um, typically in, in these kind of cartoons, there are always arrows showing subduction having this like jamming effect. But what's really happening is that um, ocean lithosphere is dense, so it's actually sinking down into the mantle. It's not being shoved, but it's sinking. So this sinking kind of allows slabs to roll back and stretch the overlying crust, and then you know we, we create new crust by um, by melting and adding stuff to the top uh, as we go through time, and that's represented by this trend towards more quote juvenile um, half neon signatures. Uh, in contrast, the Eurasian system um, has something like this with several subduction zones and overlying continental crust all being jammed together in this collage, and that has an effect to, to spread out the half mystopic space because you're recycling a lot of older continental material. Now, if we kind of compile the, uh, oh, that was not supposed to be there. If we kind of compile the, North, the ancient rocks of North America that I've studied down the bottom here, and compare that to the Circa Pacific system, which is about a billion years younger, um, what we see in time and space is sort of the same, um, the same trend. And so I essentially interpret this to say that, all right, much of this crust was added to North America by this retreating subduction zone kind of system. So not jamming together of little microplates, but of creating new crust overlying this, a long lived subduction zone. And so that's sort of my, my main takeaway here. It's obviously a little bit simplified, but uh, just wanted to show you guys and thank GPSA for funding it. Um, basically, it's a, sort of a refined view. Um, you know, like I said, dissertation is typically very nuanced. So while it's not earth shattering, pun intended, it is a, a long debate that's been going on as the exact process of how this crust was added, and my data set definitely represents a large step towards understanding that. Uh, so, thanks very much, and I'll take any questions.